Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I think if we could just take our seats and get started and please continue to enjoy your lunch. My name is Beth Fortune and I'm Vice Chancellor for Public Affairs. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our eighth uh, federal forum and to thank you for joining us. Um, these forums are hosted by our Office of Federal Relations in DC, which is headed by Christina West. And um, they're a way for her office to highlight some of the most pressing federal issues, and there are many, uh, facing research universities. I'd like to begin by um, welcoming and recognizing some of our senior leadership. Ken Galloway, the Dean of our School of Engineering, thank you for being here. Doug Christiansen, our Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and Dean of Admissions, thank you. Frank Wislow, our Dean of the Commons, thank you for being here. And we have a very special guest today who is uh, not of Vanderbilt, but works closely with Vanderbilt, and I know many of you probably know him, Claude Presnell, who is President of the Tennessee Independent Colleges and Universities Association. So it's delighted to have you here today, Claude, as well. Um, most of you know and interact on a regular basis with Christina West, who runs our Washington office, and she does an outstanding job in uh, representing Vanderbilt on Capitol Hill and keeping the campus informed of the many complex issues and politics that occur in Washington. So, Christina, thank you, as always, for your work and for organizing these forums. But this forum today also gives me um, an opportunity to recognize two new faces in our Washington office. Kevin King, Kane, who will be speaking today, joined us in December as our Director of Federal Relations, Health, and Biomedical Sciences. And we're delighted to have you, Kevin, and look forward to um, hearing from you today. And our newest member, Kara Allen, in the back here, joined us last month as our Assistant Director of Federal Relations. Now, Kara came to us from Congressman Jim Cooper's office, where she had been since her 2008 graduation from Vanderbilt. So she's a very proud and enthusiastic alum, and we're really glad to have you back on campus and representing your alma mater on, on Capitol Hill. So I hope that you all will have a chance to meet um, our two newest members of the Federal Relations Team. Now, the past forums have focused on research funding included in the Recovery Act, federal student aid, compliance regulations, and the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Today's topic is, again, extremely timely. To say that last fall's elections had a dramatic impact on Washington could be an understatement. It's pretty incredible to think that just two years ago, the Obama administration was still riding high its wave of popularity, and the Democratic Congress was only too happy to tackle the administration's priorities. In fact, it was just about two years ago that we were only beginning to realize what $21 billion in science funding in the Recovering Act would mean for Vanderbilt, and a year ago that the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. Unfortunately, though, we all realized the Recovery Act was only two-year funding. What I don't think anyone realized was how dramatically the attitude towards federal spending would change in Washington over time. I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm not alone in this room in watching what's going on in Washington these days with a fair amount of frustration. The message that Vanderbilt has been delivering to and advocating for with our con congressional delegation is that we share the concerns about our rising national de debt, but the approaches we see Washington taking to address this serious issue seem irrational. We continue to let our, our congressional de delegation know that, that it is important to recognize federal su support for education, student aid, and university-based research, that they are investments that will help our economy grow out of this recession, but apparently that is not a common position among Washington policymakers. Christina and Kevin are going to attempt today to explain what's going on with the 112th Congress and where things stand on the FY11 and FY12 budgets. No easy task given the multitude of new faces and seemingly weak, weakly attacks on the values and programs that we value. And before I turn it over to Christina, I just want to say that we always consider these forums to be the beginning of a discussion and a conversation. Um, in fact, the most important part of this is your questions and the dialogue that you have with us. So we hope that uh, we've left plenty of time for questions and answers and conversation, and we hope that you will speak up, as I know you will, as you've done in the past forums. So with that, I will turn it over to Christina. Thanks, Beth. Um, so I thought what we would do is just take a few minutes and uh, step back and look back at what happened in November. Um, just to recap, we had a, a president with an approval rating in the mid-40s. Going into the midterm elections, we had voters who were intent on sending a message. They were not happy with the status quo. 
We had the rise of, you know, whether you want to call them a third party or just a faction of the Republican Party, but certainly the Tea Party has come to uh, have a pretty strong voice in, in the midterm elections. We also had a very different electorate than we did two years ago uh, when President Obama was elected. The electorate in the midterm elections was much more conservative, much older. Swing voters and independents swung away from the Democratic Party and to the Republican Party. And of course, the bottom line in November was it's all about the economy. So we had the midterm election, and then Congress came back for its so-called lame duck session. And all too often in Washington, when we get to a lame duck session, we call it that because nothing ever really gets done. And I have to say that, that the lame duck session we had in December was anything but a do-nothing Congress. Uh, this is just a, a short list of some of the things that were uh, addressed in December. Um, first and foremost, there was a grand bargain made on taxes. There were a number of provisions in that tax uh, agreement of interest to Vanderbilt and other higher education provisions. Uh, tax Extension of tax benefits for various uh, savings account employer-provided educational assistance, student loan interest deduction, uh, IRA charitable rollover provisions were included in that tax uh, agreement, as well as, um, of course, the big ticket items in there were the, uh, the Bush tax cuts. The Competes Act didn't get a lot of national attention, uh, but certainly was a very high priority for Vanderbilt and for the, the broader higher education community and those of us who are interested in, in science research funding. Um, Senator Alexander was an instrumental player in getting the Competes Act reauthorized in the Senate. It was something that we thought was all on life support and then miraculously uh, was able to come to a unanimous agreement in the Senate and, and uh, pass that bill. The House then subsequently took up the Senate bill. Uh, was one of the last things that Congressman Bart Gordon, the chairman of the Science Committee, did in his time in Congress was manage that bill on the floor and see the Competes Act reauthorized. So that, that was, that was a, a really big uh, priority for us in the December session. However, um, despite all of these things that got done, the one thing that did not get done was they kicked the can down the road on the FY11 appropriations bills. So then, uh, early January, we had the 112th Congress convene. Um, and just to, to recap who's in the 112th Congress, we have 93 freshmen in the House of Representatives. That's nearly a quarter of the House of Representatives are in their very first term. 84 of those are Republicans. There are only nine Democratic freshmen in the House this year. In addition, 13% of the Senate are freshman senators. Again, very lopsided. We have 12 freshman Republican senators and only one freshman Democratic senator. Uh, the, in the House of Representatives, with the new Republican majority, the House Republican Conference had an opportunity to reshape the rules by which the House is governed. And they did that with a, a number of notable changes, um, probably one that I know Kevin, Kara, and I are still adjusting to a little bit is a schedule change. In all the years past that I've been doing this, the House and the Senate have pretty much had the same schedule of when they're in session versus when they're on their district work periods, and they overlap pretty consistently. The House this year made the decision that they were going to listen to their freshman members who wanted to be able to spend more time in their districts, and they adopted a three-week on, one-week in the district type of schedule. So uh, the House and the Senate have very different schedules this year, and with the exception of August and, and a few weeks in between, there's almost no time that they are both out of session, which uh, for those of us that look forward to when Congress leaves town as a chance to catch our breaths a little bit, means that we're uh, not able to have that slow time quite as much. The House also decided that they were going to do a cut-go approach whereby any bill that is brought to the House floor that proposes to spend more money must also include an offset that is going to cut an equal or greater amount of money in order to pay for that bill. They also decided that the, all the time that the House spends naming post offices and honoring sports teams is not <coughs> well worth taxpayer money, so they have claimed to do away with post office namings and those sorts of uh, opportunities for members to honor organizations and groups in their district. 
Speaker Boehner has also vowed that he wants to return a lot more power to the committees. And under Speaker Pelosi, there were a number of instances, particularly with some of the major legislation, where bills were written mainly by leadership and were not brought through the committee process. Speaker Boehner, who came out of uh, chairmanship of a House committee and, and values the role of the committees, is, is very much interested in returning the power to the committees. And, um, all indications are that we will begin to see more and more bills work their way through to the committees before they're brought to the House floor. So those are just some of the changes. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to give us a little bit of an introduction to some of the new faces we have in Congress, and then I'll talk some more about the budget and appropriations process. I, I, as Christina said, there are so many new freshman members, a quarter of the new Congress. I think the, the question a lot of people had the day after the election was kind of, who are these folks? Who, is, who makes up the new Congress? Uh, Tennessee, our delegation, had one of the largest groups uh, of new freshman members. We have four. Uh, the first one, or this one, Representative Chuck Fleischman from Tennessee Three, um, replaced Congressman Zach Womp. Uh, in his office, and he has the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in his district, um, and you can see his committees, uh, natural resources, small business, science, space, and technology. Um, so that is the first one. Representative Scott Desjardins, you may or may not remember, he actually ran commercials about how to pronounce his name uh, during his campaign. Um, he is also a physician, an MD from South Dakota, um, replaced Lincoln Davis, uh, and he received a Pell Grant uh, himself, so we're hoping that will carry a little weight with us. Uh, and you see his committees, Agriculture, Education of the Workforce, Oversight, and Government Reform. And Congressman Diane Black, uh, she prefers that uh, uh, title uh, as Congressman uh, Marsha Blackburn does as well from our delegation. Um, she, as you see, has quite a career in the Tennessee House and the Tennessee Senate and replaced Bart Gordon uh, in the Congress. And she has been identified as one of the up and coming leaders uh, by the House leadership. She is on a couple of committees that you usually don't get on as a freshman, budget and ways and means, uh, ways and means there are only two freshmen uh, in this Congress who are on Ways and Means. She is one of them, so that is very important. And her husband was an associate professor here at Vanderbilt. And finally, uh, the fourth one from the Tennessee delegation, Representative Stephen Fincher, a uh, farmer gospel singer, no prior elected office or experience uh, in elected office. He replaced John Tanner. Uh, he also has no higher education, uh, but he is on the Agriculture and Transportation Committees. Um, and now, I'll kind of give you a little run through of some of the newly elected members and, and a little bit of, about some of who, give you a little flavor of who some of the new folks are. Um, oh, what did I do? Here we go. Uh, our first one. Uh, this senator, see if you can guess who some of these folks are. The senator graduated from the Southern College of Optometry, was an optometrist before being elected to Congress in 2001. Senator John Bozeman, uh, not Boozman, uh, which causes a little consternation on the Hill sometimes. Uh, he defeated uh, Senator Blanche Lincoln from Arkansas. This next member shares a name with an American statesman that you may or may not recognize. Um, he served in the Florida House uh, from 1980 to 1998. Daniel Webster, uh, he is a Republican from the 8th District of Florida who defeated Democrat Alan Grayson. Yes, a football player, uh, six feet, seven inches tall, Played in the NFL for 13 years. Uh, Representative John Runyon from New Jersey. Um, he said his charity, charity work is what put him in touch with the community and encouraged him to run for Congress. A rancher, 
from North Dakota, Representative Christy Nome. Uh, she is one of 73 women serving in the new 112th Congress. Pizza. We have the owner of a pizza parlor in Illinois with 10 children who had also never held elected office before, Representative Bobby Schilling. Um, you see the van that one of his children drove him around in uh, while the others ran the pizza parlor while he was running for Congress. <coughs> Shoes and hats. The new member from Florida has petitioned Congressman Speaker Boehner to allow hats on the floor of the House of Representatives because she has a collection of them. Um, Representative Frederick Wilson. Um, I hope she wins. I think it would be nice to see a little, a little color on the floor of the House. Um, and Members kind of dress very conservatively, so hats would be good. The youngest member, newly elected, 30 years old, uh, from Michigan, he earned a spot on Time Magazine's 40 Under 40 list, Representative Justin Amash, and he's actually kind of a, uh, accumulating a record of voting present. He's voted present as opposed to yay or nay more than any other freshman member. Um, his original reason was that he had not had time to read the legislation. So we'll see how that goes after a while. Uh, this next representative, he's been a bus driver, a professional timber sports competitor, and a district attorney. But what probably prepared him most for Congress was his time on MTV's reality show, Real World Boston, Representative Sean Duffy of Wisconsin. And this last one, you may recognize the father and the son, uh, Representative Ben Quayle of Arizona, who also happens to be a Vanderbilt Law graduate. <coughs> Speaker Boehner uh, has been around a long time. I mean, he was a lieutenant in the Republican Revolution of 1994. He is former chairman, as Christina noted, of the Education and the Workforce Committee. He is a legislator who likes to legislate and likes to let his people do that. The Young Guns, these are two of them, uh, Representative Paul Ryan, who is the chairman of the Budget Committee, and Representative Eric Cantor, who is the majority leader, along with Representative Kevin McCarthy, who is the uh, majority whip. These are sort of the, they call themselves the Young Guns. They've written a book together about their policies and plans for the future, and they are sort of seen as the up and coming next wave of Republican leadership, if you will who are some of the chairmen of the committees now. There's three chairman house, sitting house chairmen who were defeated uh, in the last uh, wave of elections. These are some of the new ones. Chairman Ralph Hall, science, space, and technology, and you see the jurisdiction, a lot of which is very interesting uh, for us and covers a lot of issues that are important to us. Three of his subcommittee chairs are freshmen. Uh, one of those is Representative Quayle. Chairman Dave Camp, Ways and Means. Uh, you don't get much more important than that, uh, what is it, the second, uh, third one down that says revenue measures generally. That's anything that covers taxes or revenue. That's a pretty broad, uh, broad foundation and covers a lot as you might expect. And finally, Representative Fred Upton, Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He almost did not become Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee because he supported phasing out incandescent light bulbs and was deemed by some to be insufficiently conservative because of that. But he did win the chairmanship, and this is probably the broadest jurisdiction that doesn't involve taxes. And now, We'll turn it back over to Christina. Thank you. Yes. But you didn't say anything about the scientific views of our new representative who is, uh, has Oak Ridge in his district. We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so Kevin's given you a pretty good overview of some of the new faces that we have and, and some of the leadership positions that they have. Um, just to, to kind of give you a few other statistics, there are four freshmen that were assigned to the Appropriations Committee. There are six freshmen on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, the Science Committee Chairman, as Kevin mentioned, has four subcommittees, three of which are being chaired by freshmen who have no prior experience serving in a congressional committee, much less running a congressional committee. Um, and many of, our, of the freshmen this year have explicitly stated that they are not necessarily in Washington to get reelected, that they are here to scale, scale back the size and scope of government. There also, I might note, has uh, been a resurgence of members who are sleeping in their offices as a way to st save money. They also are a cohesive voting bloc. Uh, early in February, Speaker Boehner brought up two bills under suspension of the rules, which is an expedited um, mechanism to pass legislation. You can't amend a bill, but you do need two-thirds of, of the vote in order to pass the bill. He brought up reauthorizing the Patriot Act and a bill that would rescind uh, you, our contribution to the UN. Both bills failed mainly because he did not hold his own party together. The, the freshman Republicans voted against reauthorizing the Patriot Act, and they voted against rescinding the UN dues. This is a very strong and cohesive freshman Republican class. They are determined to cut the size and scope of government. They are determined to cut the budget. So we've talked a lot about the House, what's going on in the Senate. And quite honestly, um, not a lot. The Senate has been a lot slow to get started. Um, basically, the only major piece of legislation other than continuing resolutions to keep the government open that the Senate has passed has been the patent reform bill. Um, we have already started to see 2012 play into the dynamics in the Senate. Mm -hmm. In the 2012 cycle, there are 23 Democrats who are up for re-election versus only 10 Republicans. Eight senators have already announced that they are retiring at the end of 2012 and will not run for re-election. It's five Democrats and three Republicans. Presidential politics has already started to come into play. There's already been at least one senator, Senator Thune, who has said that he will not run for president. Um, but there's lots of things swirling about, and, and that dynamic has already started to come into play. Senator Alexander has already announced that he is going to run for the number two position in the Senate Republican leadership. That would be uh, Senate Whip, Republican Whip, um, because the person currently in that position has announced that he's retiring. So lots of dynamics at play in the Senate, but not a lot of legislation getting done. So here we are halfway through fiscal year 11, and we still don't have any department or agency in the federal government with a budget, including the Defense Department. Um, we spoke a minute ago about the power of the freshmen. The House Republican leadership initially put out their proposal for funding FY11, and the freshman Republicans balked and said that does not cut enough. Uh, we want $100 billion in cuts this year, and that's the only thing that we're going to be satisfied by. So what the Republicans went back, they came back and put together HR1. Uh, that would cut $100 billion from the FY11 re president's request uh, in over just the remaining period of FY11. So all of those cuts would be consolidated into the remaining six months or so of the year. The Senate leadership countered with $51 billion in cuts. The Senate took up both their Democratic alternative and HR1. Both bills failed, which we expected. But interestingly enough, H.R. 1 got more votes than the Senate Democratic alternative. So those two are sort of the bookends of what we're looking at and where we're likely to see things end up for FY11. We have had six now continuing resolutions funding the government for this year. Um, the first three got us through the end of the year. The one that, that expired just this past Friday uh, cut just over $4 billion, from, namely from earmarks and programs that the administration had already proposed to terminate. Um, there was one program in that fifth continuing resolution that does impact institutions of higher education. It's a small, relatively small student aid program, 
that goes to the states and then the states use it to develop their need-based financial aid program. That program has been terminated. The sixth continuing resolution, which the President signed into law either last Thursday or Friday, buys us another three weeks uh, and takes us through to April 8. It also cuts $6 billion, mainly from earmarks and again from other programs already identified by the administration as um, things that they're willing to eliminate. There's nothing in the current CR that uh, dramatically impacts colleges and universities. But you'll note a pattern. Um, we're looking at cutting $2 billion a week has been what, what they have been sort of targeting. So um, what's interesting to note about the latest CR is that there in the House there were 54 Republicans who voted against it. And it was an interesting mix of 54 Republicans. A lot of them were the freshman class and the more conservative Tea Party types who were opposed that we shouldn't be funding the government this way, we need to be cutting more, we need to get done, and we need to cut the $100 billion. Also in that 54 Republicans who opposed it, though, were some senior and more moderate appropriators who also took the opinion that this is no way to fund a government. We need to come to a conclusion and a resolution on this. The only reason that continuing resolution passed is because there were around 100 Democrats who supported it as well. If the Democrats hadn't supported it, Boehner wouldn't have been able to pass that continuing resolution in the House last week. What that tells those of us who are watching this pretty carefully is that there is no appetite for another short-term continuing resolution. April 8th is pretty much it, and they're going to have to come to some kind of deal um, on FY11 by April 8th in order to, to get something passed. So with that in mind, um, let's recap a little bit of what was in HR1 since that's sort of the starting point of where we're looking at and, and really what our focus has been on is avoiding the cuts that are in HR 1. This gives you just kind of a list of, of the science funding and student aid programs and the cuts that they were um, proposed in HR 1. All of these are cuts below the FY10 level. FY10 is of course what we're, being, what we're funded at right now, so everything is in comparison to FY, FY10. Um, various agencies have put together analyses of what the implications of these cuts were to go into effect would be, how many students would lose Pell Grants, um, the elimination of the SEOG program. Uh, Department of Energy probably has the most extensive list that I've seen because they've gone in and looked at what the impacts would be on the national labs. And there you're talking about furloughing many employees, closing entire facilities, uh, and, and stopping various construction projects. NSF estimates that there would be probably 500 grants that would not be awarded for the remainder of the year. Uh, I have heard anecdotally that we would be looking at a couple of NSF career awards that we may not receive this year if these cuts were to go into effect. So HR1 came to the House floor in mid-February. It was the first time that the leadership, uh, either Democrat or Republican, brought an appropriations bill to the House floor under an open rule process, meaning that anyone could offer any amendment to the bill and it would be debated. As a result, there were 500 amendments that were filed to the bill, and approximately 100 of those were debated over four days of debate that went from 10 in the morning until 2, 3, 4 o'clock the following morning. Uh, it was a bit of a chaotic process. Um, there were any number of amendments that actually did pass, including an, a number that would have um, prohibited implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, including some that actually would prohibit salaries being paid to federal employees who implement the law, was one tactic that was taken. <coughs> the bill ultimately passed. Our delegation voted strictly party lines, which is pretty much what everybody did and the President issued a veto on the bill. So uh, the bottom line is HR 1 will not become law, but it is the starting point for all of our advocacy efforts. So what has Vanderbilt been doing through all of this? Um, as Kevin mentioned, we have four new members of our delegation. Out of a House delegation of nine, that gives us a lot of new faces to get to know, including staff. So we have been spending an inordinate amount of our time up on the hill, meeting with the new staff, introducing them to us and who we are and what we do. Um, 
and explaining to them what the impact of these cuts would be for us, why this funding is important, what we're doing with federal support both uh, for research and for student aid programs. Um, my office sent a letter, uh, I think there were copies of it out on the table when you came in, it's also up on our website. We sent that letter to the delegation uh, during floor consideration of HR 1 opposing the draconian cuts proposed in that bill and we had, uh, thanks to many of the folks in this room, some really great um, detailed examples of what the impacts would be at Vanderbilt if those cuts were to go into effect. Once that bill passed, then attention really has shifted to the Senate and what's been going on there. Um, and what's been really interesting this year, and I, I think not only do we have a new dynamic among members of Congress, but lots of institutions have had to, to think how they do their advocacy efforts and, and what, they, what their priorities are and how they're working with others. And I've been really pleased this year that we've been able to do um, some joint meetings and joint events with, Oak, with uh, Battelle, which manages Oak Ridge National Lab, as well as the University of Tennessee. And to me, you know, certainly there are differences between Vanderbilt and UT and Oak Ridge. Um, but when you have those three organizations in a room together meeting with members of Congress and their staff and saying, this is a bad thing for the state, and we're not just talking Vanderbilt, we're not just talking UT, we're talking across the entire state. To me, I think that sends a really powerful message. And I think that was particularly epitomized um, by another letter that was out on the table that was sent to both Senator Alexander and Senator Corker from Chancellor Zeppos as well as the new president from UT. And at least in my knowledge, and um, I've I think Beth would say even beyond the time that I've been here, that's the first time that there's been a letter sent by the leaders of our two institutions to Capitol Hill talking about something like this. So um, to me that, that's pretty exciting and I, I think it sends a powerful message. And we followed that up with some meetings with uh, the Senate, senior Senate staff, and I think it resonated with them as well. Now we're also very fortunate that um, you know, Senator Alexander understands our priorities. Um, and <coughs> shares our concerns. This was the response that I got back uh, from his senior appropriations person who reiterated to me in person that the senator has three priorities for all legislation this year and the number one priority of those three is science and research and education. So uh, unfortunately, as he, his staff will also tell me, he is one of a hundred and um, I've been told that human cloning probably isn't going to happen anytime soon, so we have our work cut out for us. Um, but Senator Alexander certainly is doing what he can. Um, we've talked a little bit about the continuing resolutions. Um, both the House and the Senate are in recess this week. This is one of those rare weeks when both houses of Congress are, are out at the same time. When they come back, they'll have two weeks to try and resolve uh, somewhere between $51 billion and $100 billion in cuts. And we'll see, you know, it's still anyone's guess as to how this is all going to play out. In the meantime, though, uh, you know, 2012 is underway as well. We had a budget that was released in mid-February, the same week that the House took up H.R. 1. The President released his FY12 budget. Um, as far as student aid goes, you know, the president is on, uh, believes in student aid, believes in education, and has made it a priority. He's proposing to maintain the maximum Pell Grant award at 5550, although to do so, he proposes eliminating the year-round or summer Pell, as well as the in-school interest subsidy for loans for graduate and professional students. Uh, and he's proposed an expansion of the Perkins program, although in order to, to pay for that, it, the interest rate on those loans would rise and there would not anymore be an in-school interest subsidy. On the research side, uh, these are, so again, we're operating under comparing FY10 to FY12 because we have no FY11 numbers. And again, you know, we've got a president who understands the importance of, of research and science and uh, is willing to make some pretty substantial, all things considered, investments and increases in those budget accounts. Um, the NIH budget includes funding for the proposed Cures Acceleration Network. NSF was a huge winner with a proposed 13% increase. 
The new NSF director has put a renewed emphasis on interdisciplinary research, which is reflected in a number of new programs that they have in their budget. DOE's Office of Science also sees a healthy 9% increase in its budget along the lines of what was authorized in the America Competes Act. The Institute for Education Sciences at the Department of Education would also see an, an, an increase, um, which the administration claims would uh, enable them to award $40 million in new research grants. NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, is one of the few agencies that actually is, is proposed for a decrease in its budget. Um, the President's request would essentially bring the endowment back to its FY08 levels. Um, however, you know, all of these numbers are great, but uh, I have to, what we have reiterated and, and cautioned folks is, this is likely to be the high water mark. Um, I will be, I'm willing to be wrong, but I would be shocked if we actually do see numbers like these materialize whenever we finally do get done with FY12. It's always nice to have the president on your side and to have him talk about the importance of, uh, of Pell Grants and student aid. Um, this is a comment that he made at a press, a press conference on March 11th. He's reiterated it time and time again. He's, it's clear that our priorities are his priorities. However, this can also complicate some of our efforts with House Republicans who basically are of the opinion that anything coming out of the administration they are opposed to and that this budget is dead on arrival as far as they are concerned. He's also made really strong comments about the importance of investing in research and development and the need to continue to make those investments in order to grow our economy and to help us win the future. I think we've all heard him use those phrases over and over again. So all that to be said, what else is out there on the congressional schedule this year? Uh, I think first and foremost, we're all aware that the new uh, House Republican majority is, is intent on stopping, defunding, amending, otherwise preventing the Affordable Care Act from going into uh, effect. There will be numerous attempts to, to prevent funding from being used um, or other policy riders that get attached to, to different pieces of legislation. At some point this spring, we will have to have a vote on increasing the debt limit. Uh, Chairman Bernanke has indicated that that could come as soon as mid-April, could be stretched out into sometime in May, possibly early June. But it's pretty clear from House Republicans that uh, they're going to use that as a leverage point to demand further rescissions, uh, scaling back of government spending, or other changes um, to decrease the size and the scope of government. It's possible that instead of doing one substantial debt limit increase that'll take us through, you know, another couple years, that they will do it on an incremental basis so that they will be faced with having to do the same vote every couple of months. Um, Medicare physician payment fix, this is another big cost, big ticket item that has to be addressed before the end of the year. Uh, patent reform, as I mentioned earlier, has passed the Senate, is awaiting consideration in the House. ESEA, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, No Child Left Behind, whatever we're going to call it this time around, there's still calls to have that reauthorized this year. It's one area where there could actually be some bipartisan agreement. Um, it's just a matter of will we actually see floor consideration of that reauthorization. Net neutrality is something that uh, has gotten a lot of attention in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Congressman Blackburn has been very vocal in her views on net neutrality, so that's out there. Uh, and we get to a lot of, of talk about regulatory and entitlement reform, whether it's stopping the EPA from issuing greenhouse gas regulations. There's already been some hearings in the House Education Committee on um, regulatory burdens at, in education, both at the K-12 level as well as higher ed. Again, it gets to this idea of scaling back the size and scope of government. Um, so what are our goals from, from our office and, and Vanderbilt's advocacy position? This year, I think the major goal is simply to avoid the sorts of cuts that we've seen proposed in HR1. Um, more so than, than in years past, if we end up with a flat budget, that's going to be a successful year for us, I'm afraid. Certainly not where we would like to see it, but that's the reality. Um, Secondly, we've talked a lot about building relationships with our new offices. 
that's going to be of paramount importance to us this year. We've already had a number of folks, including Dean Galloway, who has been who have been up to Washington to help us in that effort. Um, Doug is going to be up later this month, and, and I know others of you will as well. That's critically important. Uh, Kevin and Kara and I are in the offices on at least a weekly basis, but it's it's also you know, they get tired of seeing our faces all the time. So having folks from campus be able to come up and talk about what these impacts really are going to mean for us is critically important. Along with building those relationships is educating our members on what we're doing. Uh, Dean Benbow was up last week, and although the the primary purpose of, of her visits was again to talk about the importance of fu federal funding for education research. The way that, that we approached it, given the climate, was um, this is the sort of research that's going on at Vanderbilt and this is the impact that it's having in our community, in our state, and, and more broadly than that. And uh, that we want to be a resource to the members and to the staff. Feel free to contact us if you have, would like to talk about any of these things further. We're happy to take questions now. Um, we, have a, we are always happy to talk to folks on campus. We have, uh, I think most of you are aware, our office puts out an almost daily news roundup called DC Brief. Um, Janelle St. Croix in our office, you will often get emails from her on that. If you're not already receiving that, e that email and you would like to, there's a sign-up sheet outside. We'd be more than happy to add you to the distribution list. So um, with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. And we can talk about our new members' view on climate change, if you would like. <laughs> Thank you, Christina and Kevin. And I think that you can see why we have um, an Office of Federal Relations in, in uh, Washington. There is a lot going on, and the stakes are very, very high for institutions like Vanderbilt. So um, we invite your questions. No? Yes. On climate change? Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of skepticism. Um, and there's a number of committees that are likely going to be holding hearings. The Energy and Commerce hearing, Energy and Commerce Committee held a hearing a couple of weeks ago, um, the first one on, on climate change. It's been targeted, you know, you look at where the cuts are in HR1 and there are significant cuts to the EPA. Uh, within the Department of Energy's Office of Science, there's a, an, a program in there called Biological and Environmental Research, BER. Uh, they are slated for a 50% cut under HR1. And the re rationale behind that is the view that that is the office that funds climate. Well, yes, they do fund climate, but they fund an awful lot more than that as well. And the result, you know, when you're talking a 50% cut in half of a year, you've zeroed out a whole program within Office of Science. So um, there are definite efforts to prevent EPA from implementing those regulations uh, and to block funding from going to programs that they are opposed to. Other questions? Elise. Especially for the four new members, do you have plans for getting them or their staff members on campus? That's a great question. Yeah. I'll let Kevin take that. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, in April, in fact, uh, we are planning a trip. Uh, in fact, I was kind of walking the, the route a little earlier uh, yesterday uh, through through the medical center. We, are, we have issued invitations to Congressman Cooper has a new health staffer and all four of the legislative directors for the four new members, uh, for the five of them to come down in April and, and tour the medical center. We're going to try and follow that up this fall with a, we've, we've done the, the clinical medical center tours for a number of years, um, and we're going to explore the possibility of doing something similar that's more focused on research that would be in the fall. Yeah, this is really a relationship building year for us and we're doing everything that we possibly can to take advantage of that and establish our relationships with our congressional delegation across the institution. And we appreciate everybody's help in, in doing that. Christy. He has also been supportive as well, and, and his staff certainly understand the importance of, of science and research as well as education. 
Um, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting when you have two senators, you'll often have, they'll make some strategic choices in terms of their committee assignments and what they're really going to focus on. And Senator Alexander has carved out such a name for himself as a leader on education issues as well as science that, um, you know, to, to Senator Corker's benefit, it probably makes sense for him to focus some of his efforts on other areas. So that's why we haven't seen him. Um, or at least that's one reason why we maybe haven't seen him out in front quite as much on some of these issues, simply because Senator Alexander is already there. Um, but we've had very positive conversations with his staff, uh, and they understand where we are. And, and you know, his voting record—he tends to vote with uh, the Republican Party, um, and that's something that we're working on. But in conversations with with the staff they understand what it is that we're there to talk about. Yes. Oh, go ahead. What kind of conversation is going on in Washington about the impact of HR1 kinds of cuts on women or maybe say unemployment and who's having those conversations and what impact are they on I think, well, Speaker Boehner um, was at a press conference, I think, during consideration of HR 1, and someone said to him, you know the impact of this is going to be perhaps thousands of, their point was specifically federal employees would lose their job. Um, his, he was quoted as his response was, so be it. Um, you know, I... I Yes. Yes. Does anybody understand that? One hopes so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, the, the, the talking about really smart people sitting on an employment line, at least in the worst case scenario here. Yeah, you're right. And what I'm afraid we're looking at is, is a whole bunch of freshmen who simply want to cut and perhaps have not thought it through quite as much as to what the impact of those cuts may be on their constituents. Um, I was at a meeting with Congressman Fleischman's legislative director and talking about H.R. 1, and he made the point of telling me, you know, there were some amendments uh, to the bill that would have cut DOE Office of Science even further, and the congressman voted against those because he knew what the impact would be at Oak Ridge. The subsequent comment was, and he has taken heat from the Tea Party for those votes. Kara, did you have something to add? So to follow up on that point, there, and I don't think initially when HR1 came out, you know, a lot of people were analyzing what the impacts would be because it was just, there was such a big vote. Like, all right, let's look at this. Um, and I think in recent weeks, there have been several economists, prominent economists who have come out and said, you know, this is going to be the impact I, I've seen in 700,000 jobs. Um, and so, yes, I think that's, it's taken a little while to trickle down to that level, but there are people that are coming out and actually finding those numbers. So we are starting. But they're also not hearing that message from people back home. I mean, the, the people they are hearing from are the Tea Party people, as Christina said, when they get back to the town hall meetings, and their message is just cut, period, indiscriminately. Yes? To what extent uh, do you have um, cooperative arrangements with other offices representing other universities to work together? How does all that uh, Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Uh, we are very fortunate as members of the Association of American Universities as well as AAMC, which represents the medical centers. Um, we work very, very closely with those associations uh, and the other university federal relations offices. We do a lot of joint meetings. We collaborate on talking points, on strategies, on messaging, uh, so that by and large we're all on the same page when we're going in to talk about research funding. In addition to the associations, um, through my office, Vanderbilt is a member of a number of coalitions and, and other advocacy groups that are focused on specific subject matters or, or issue areas. So for instance, we're a member of the Student Aid Alliance that's specifically focused on student aid, um, the Coalition for National Security Funding that's focused on DOD research, Energy Sciences Coalition on DOE, Coalition for National Science Funding on NSF, United for Medical Research on NIH, and each one of those groups is delving even deeper into the impact and strategy specifically related to those agencies or, or student aid programs. And we are 
active participants in all of those efforts as well. So yes, it's very coordinated. Um, and we rely a great deal on our relationships with other federal relations folks. Doug? Yeah, Doug? Go ahead, Doug. Okay. Um, in today's Chronicle, there was quite a bit of chatter on looking at the tell. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would be curious, from your perspective, Christina, um, what do you think? The reduction in tell is one thing, but the reordering or remaking a new tell program is yet again another. And one of the suggestions was is pulling out the proprietary schools from the regular school or from the non-proprietary schools and really starting to show where those dollars go. What do you think about that and what momentum will the whole overhaul of Pell come independent of if they cut the funding? Yes. Um, so <laughs> to also put this in perspective to some of the research folks and to, to so that you think you've got a stake in the Pell decision as well. So um, the Department of Education and, the, and HHS are funded in the same appropriations bill. For whatever reason, that's the way Congress funds the Departments of Labor, HHS, and Education in one bill. So we have numerous competing priorities in that very large appropriations bill. NIH is a 31 or so, give or take a little bit, billion dollar agency. Pell, and Claude and, and Doug can correct me if I'm a little bit off here, but Pell is estimated by 2012 to be a $40 billion yeah. program. $10 billion more than NIH. Just five years ago, it was two, two years ago. No, wait, it was about 20 million or 22 million. 22 billion about five years ago. So the Pell program has almost doubled in the last five years or so which makes Pell a huge conversation for the higher education community at large because now we've got something that is, has always competed with NIH but now is significantly bigger than NIH, uh, which you know, poses its own issues. Pell being a $40 billion program is not sustainable in this current fiscal climate. So the question becomes, you know, do you decrease the maximum award, which is basically what HR1 did, it cut, would cut $845 out of the maximum award, um, or do you look at, and or do you look at some policy changes in terms of changing eligibility for students? Uh, there has certainly been some talk, and Claude and I have heard this firsthand from, from staff in our delegation, on limiting eligibility tying eligibility to institutional factors. Historically, Pell is, Pell is basically a voucher. It goes to the, if the student is eligible, it goes to the student and the student can choose whether they want to go to Vanderbilt or MTSU or UT or Northern Virginia Community College. And they get the same amount of money. It's strictly based on their financial need. There's starting to be some chatter about tying an institution's ability to participate in the Pell program to things such as tuition growth, endowment payout, endowment size, graduation rates, low-income student enrollment, all of these sorts of factors that would dramatically change how the Pell program works. As far as the for-profits go, um, that's a very delicate subject that uh, I think by and large the, our community has focused more on dealing with Pell and not getting into the conversation of for-profits, non-profits. But it is worth noting that the for-profit sector enrolls approximately 10% of the students. They receive approximately 25% of the Pell dollars. So. Thank you. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is sort of looking back. And the, the question is, why did Congress not pass a budget for FY11? And does this give them any sort of appetite to say, gee, we're getting we're getting some, tra some traction with these CRs, maybe we should just continue that process. And then the second question is, I'm curious about where you think the implementation of health care reform is likely to go between now and the election, uh, the next president of the election. I'll let Kevin take the health care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's fine, that's fair. Um, I would love to be able to tell you I had all the answers on that. Um, John Manning I, would like to have I, Yeah, he, he, really, he really would. <laughs> it would be helpful. 
I, I think every day we end up with more questions on that. I mean, it, it, Christina alluded to her in, in the presentation earlier. I mean, when you're literally attaching riders to, to legislation saying no HHS employee salaries shall go to implementing the legislation, I mean, you're reaching pretty far into trying to, to really tear it apart. Um, and at the same time, you also have, uh, I think four courts have decided now, uh, two in favor of the individual mandate, two against the individual mandate, is it, it's gonna go to the Supreme Court. Um, if that section of, of the legislation falls, the economics don't work. I mean, it, it really, large parts of it fall completely apart. Um, so you have all of those factors kind of tied in together. Uh, and, and you really do have, you know, a, a certain kind of core group of members, anything that's attached to that piece of legislation, they are just opposed to. Um, and anything they can do, you know, I, I had one of the members say, you know, we're, we're going to pull one thread out until the sleeve falls off. So that's, that's kind of what they're looking at. But you, you have a couple different tracks as far as the court, you know, the court side of it and then the legislative side. So it's, uh, it's going to be really tough. Uh, you guys have some really difficult decisions to, to it's hard to make any long-term decisions because you, you just don't know. In the meantime, the agencies are trying to issue regulations before. Every day. Yeah, before <laughs> they're told they can. Um, and with respect to could we see a whole series of CRs getting us through the end of the year? I've asked that question of staff, and um, because at one point I, I could have seen that scenario playing out as painful as it seems like it would have been. Um, I think the fact that 54 Republicans oppose this latest CR is an indication that they can't keep doing it this way. They've got to come to some sort of resolution uh, and, and be done with it. I think. You know, Speaker Boehner is a pretty smart guy. He's been around a long time. He knows how this works. He knows that he's going to have to compromise. It's going to be a matter of communicating that to his cop to his conference and keeping them all on the same page. Um, you know, I, th I think there there are negotiations going on between the White House and leaders in both the House and the Senate, um, and we'll see where they end up. Why didn't they do it in December? Um, politics I think was a lot of it you know there was uh, on the one hand I, you know I was certainly I think a lot of us were certainly hoping that the Democrats would see this is our last chance to have our mark on appropriations let's do it and be done with it and and you know not kick this down the road uh, Republicans were basically coming back and saying look we got we won't use the word mandate in the midterm elections but the American people sent a pretty strong voice that they want us to be making decisions. You shouldn't be making these sorts of major decisions in a lame duck session um, when you know that there's going to be a Republican majority coming in in the House next month. Uh, and, and I think the Democrats finally made the decision that you want it, okay, here, it's your problem, now you fix it. Uh, and ultimately that's what they decided to do. We would have been better off though because at that point we were talking about, you know, moderate, sl small increases or level funding. We weren't talking about cutting back to, to FY08 levels, certainly. Christina, what about the possibility of a government shutdown? There's a lot of talk about that. Um, before the first, the, the big CR uh, went till March 4th, and then we've had the two shorter mm -hmm. ones here. I think there was a scenario certainly at play that after that March 4th we could have seen a shutdown. Um, at that point I think the, the House freshmen were not, a, they didn't, hadn't been around long enough to understand that a government shutdown is a really bad way to cut money out of the government and you need to pass these short term CRs to buy yourself some negotiating room. Now that they've passed two of them. Um, there's still certainly some chatter about a shutdown. I would, ha if, if I was going to bet, I would say it's probably not going to happen. Okay. Other questions? Dr. Davis. Yes. In a situation of diminishing funds, period, do you ever see a situation or circumstance where universities would come in competition with national labs for 
funding. Don't we already? I don't know, you relied with Patel and so on. Well, we, we work with, with Patel and others on the big picture. You know, I think from, from where we sit, our goals is, are to, you know, a rising tide lift all, lifts all boats. If we can protect the existing funds, then, uh, you know, we look at the macro level, then we let you and, and all of your colleagues go out and compete for whatever funding is available. Um, and, you know, that's been our message to, to staff as well in our conversations has been research and, and science and education, we just need some predictability. We need some sustainability and we just need to know what the end result is going to be. Uh, and if we are looking at a situation of, of smaller pots, you know, we're going to fight against that. But if that's where we end up, so be it. Just let us know where we're going to end up so that folks can go out there and compete even if it's for smaller funding. On the student aid front, we've got real issues. Um, Doug can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is most universities are already starting to award financial aid packages for the class coming in in the fall, and we don't know if, that, if we should be awarding a Pell maximum of 5550 or something lower. Um, the department is operating under the assumption that it is a 5550 maximum Pell and that there will be SEOG and, and there will be all these other programs. Um, if, if the final decision is otherwise, you know, that, that really harms students and families who have been told or have been awarded one package and then are finding out that maybe that package isn't going to be all there. Or an institution is going to have to come in and plug that, those holes with institutional dollars, which may or may not be possible given, a, given the institution. Christina, yeah. to put a realness on that, um, Dave Moning and his shop tomorrow, <laughs> along with all the admissions offers for next year, not continuing students, but just uh, new students. We mail tomorrow afternoon 24,000 packages, 24,000, almost 25,000 notices, of which some portion of about half or three quarters of that will get something on the aid side or half, noting different things right now. So it's a real problem. It's a real issue. Other questions? No, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time, so I think if there are no other questions, we will um, adjourn for the spring, and we'll be back in the fall with another federal forum. Again, thank you for attending, and thank you to everyone for all of your assistance in our advocacy and relationship-building efforts in Washington. Have a great day.